Hi, this is Chuck Fry, founder and publisher of Innovation Tools. I'm, I'm meeting here with Gene Slowinski, Strategic Alliance and Open Innovation Director at Rutgers University. He's just finished a presentation here at the CODEV and Open Innovation Conference in Scottsdale. Just a few questions for you, Gene. Uh, where do companies typically go wrong when they're setting up Open Innovation Alliances? Well, one of, the, one of the big problems that they have is that they don't understand that every alliance is really three relationships in one. There's the alliance we all know about between company A and company B, but then there's an internal alliance inside company A. Do we all agree on goals, timelines, milestones? And that exact same relationship has to occur in company B. So if we, have, if we create and manage both alliances simultaneously internally, the alliance between the two organizations will really go quite well. I think you mentioned this afternoon that if you've got uh, business units and geographically dispersed companies, it becomes even more complex than that. It can become extraordinarily complex when you have multiple business units in different geographies and the alliance impacts all of them. The real question is, can you put together an alliance that meets your business objectives while minimizing the number of groups that put together or use a phased relationship to start the alliance in geography one, move to geography two, and then to geography three. So phased relationships are a good way to deal with that problem. Great suggestion. Um, why do so many companies do such a poor job of defining their wants when they're pursuing open innovation? That seems to be a problem area. Well, it's, it's easy to define wants that are very close to the core. And in business units, they know their businesses very well. So incremental wants are easy to define. The harder part is when you move into breakthrough innovation or moving into adjacent spaces. In breakthrough innovation, our intellectual property portfolio lets us down. We may have some patents that, that read on the areas we're interested, but we might not have many. Our supply chains, the, the suppliers that we use in our, in our core business might not be the same suppliers we need to move into a breakthrough or adjacent space. And the same thing with channels. If co companies tend to be uncomfortable moving into an area where they really don't have established channels that they trust and rely on. So that's the big problem. You have to find partners that can, that can fill those gaps that we do not have. Well, I think too sometimes companies are hamstrung by the channel relationships they have legally with those contracts and they're afraid to even touch that. They don't even want to go there. The tyranny of suppliers, yes. Yeah. The, the suppliers can can you lose a degree of freedom when you have a relationship, and that may be the degree of freedom you lose. Right. Next question, you've, you've said this afternoon that when the word innovation is mentioned, marketing and other business functions tend to say to themselves, well, that's being handled by R&D, we don't have to worry about it, and they just kind of wash their hands of it. Nothing for them to be concerned about. How do you mobilize others on the value-added chain to become more concerned about innovation? Well, if you take a look at the the value-added chain. It's sort of R&D and development and regulatory and manufacturing and marketing and sales and support. And each one of these links on the chain can really increase the value of their contribution to the corporation by thinking through what external assets they need to be successful. So the, in my experience, the best way to do it is to allow them to have a small but quick success and it quickly becomes apparent that that success can be replicated time and again through a careful de definition of what they want to achieve in the outside world. So that inspires some people and it creates some momentum that's very important in those early stages, correct? There's, there's, there's nothing like an early success to encourage further activity of the type you're looking for. Yeah. Great. Uh, can you talk a minute about the role of branding and positioning companies as a partner of choice? How important is that? Well, in the area of open innovation, what we're really trying to do is to encourage people to bring us their very interesting technology or markets or channels first. And to the extent we can build the processes, the tools, and the metrics of open innovation into a competency of the firm, people will naturally become attracted to us and bring us what they have first. And that's the purpose of being partner of choice. And in most industries, that chair is empty. There may be a 
There may be a company with one foot on the podium, but in most industries, the partner of chair choice is empty, and there's no reason why your company shouldn't sit in it. Interesting. Uh, last question, Jean. Where should companies look to identify potential partners for open innovation? Are there some places that you recommend? Well, all of that starts with the one. If you know what you want, then where to look becomes a lot more obvious. But small high technology firms are a likely place. Universities can be a good place, but you have to be careful about the university. Some universities are very uncommercial in the terms that they're looking for. But a place that I would encourage people to look for, if you're a US-based company or you have manufacturing in the United States, is federal laboratories. Federal laboratories have a great deal of technology and they are incented to work with US companies or US or, or foreign companies with US manufacturing. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank yeah. you very much, Gene. Thank you.